my name is Kora Naito. I am also from Academia Sinica. Today I'll be presenting to you our statistical study on micrometer-sized organic inclusion in meteorites. And this research is supervised by Dr. Zan Peters, the previous talker, and Dr. Typhon Lee. Starting with a brief introduction of meteorites, um, as you can see in the diagram, meteorites see this many categories. And today I am presenting specifically these three groups in carbonaceous uh, chondrites. And some of the characteristics of carbonaceous chondrites include they're rich in organics, uh, containing up to about seven weight percent of carbon. They're rare, accounting for about 5% of all meteorite falls. And they see various degrees of aqueous alteration. Now, the previous talk mainly focused on large features, um, such as the one that might look like that, or this vein in this, in this diagram, or in this picture. This, this analysis, this study, focuses on these little dots, which represent carbon inclusions that are typically about one micrometer in size. Now, one of the most conventional ways of analyzing what's on the, what's on the surface of meteorite may be, look, may be to look at one of these single images. So if you remember from the previous talk, NanoSims 50L is capable of producing up to seven elements. So it can simultaneously analyze seven elements, plus one image for secondary electrons. Now, what we did for this analysis was instead mapping a whole a uh, large section of the meteorite sample, and we try to statistically investigate uh, the collection of these single images. And for reference, um, so this, each, each of these frames represents one of these single images. So here's a list of species that we investigated, um, CH3 chondrite, CM2, and two CR, uh, CR chondrites. And the bar graph on the right-hand side represents, oh, sorry, represents how many images we took for each species. And I'm going to skip over these uh, slides because uh, Zan has already extensively talked about how nanosims works. Um, so how did, we how did we exactly investigate that many single images? Uh, we used the big data approach, which is a trend in astronomy and many other sciences. But why is the big data approach invoked for this particular application? Well, there are several reasons for that. One is that uh, large numbers of inclusions cannot be simply handled by hand. Two, by using an automated object recognition tool, we can possibly suppress uh, selection bias. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that in a few moments. Um, one big advantage that uh, Given a, a set of raw data of meteorites, we can be creative and go and look for some parameters or any parameters we are interested in. For example, size and shape, isotopes, spatial distribution, and clustering. And I, have enough to, I hope I, I have enough time today to go through all these results. And given the results, we, we can then go discover some trends among different meteorite groups. So here's a basic flow of what we did for this analysis. Uh, we started off mapping. Um, and just a reminder, uh, the image quality is relatively low due to the explanation given by Zan. Um, and each of the species was actually measured uh, by different users under different nanosim settings at different times. So we normalize the data for each species so that we can make a fair comparison among them. And we used a tool for an automated uh, detection to, uh, recognition. And we filtered out some of the outputs, which may include, include false positives. And different, characteri different characteristics may require different filter settings. And when the data is finally ready for statistics, we conducted data science so that, uh, we, in the hope that we can find some new information on organics of meteorites. So what do I mean by a possible suppression of human uh, selection bias? Um, if you look at these two images, they're actually exactly the same, same image, 
but the one, the one on the left hand side is full scale, and the one on the right is scaled to very low counts. Now, if you are today, uh, by, by looking at one of these images and try to look for inclusions by hand, the chances are that you'll be missing some of the inclusions which are supposed to be there in these green circles, causing selection bias. So we use a tool called Source Extractor, which is an image recognition tool for astronomical observation. But it is generic enough that it has already seen its use in many sciences, such as neuroscience and biology and so on. Detection is uh, done based on contrast of the background. So it calculates uh, mean background of each of the grid, and it smoothes over the whole, whole image to calculate the threshold value. And whatever features which go beyond this threshold value of this single image are called regions of interest, ROIs. And we call these ROIs inclusions. So we are using a very unique uh, tool for detecting inclusions in a meteorite. The question is, how well is it doing? I'm recalling the same images. And this is a full scale. And for a reminder, uh, each each frame consists of 256 pixels in both X and Y directions, and that corresponds to 20 micrometers in SI units. But the idea is that we want to pick up as many inclusions as possible, including those very faint objects. So we want the tool to output an image, something, image that looks something like this, and the result is this. So it's safe to say that it's a it's doing a pretty decent work in there. Now, as I said, Source Extractor is a, is a tool for astronomical observation. So it outputs a table of data that, are, that have to do with astronomical objects, such as numbers, uh, which are essentially labels for each, for each object, and XY coordinates, uh, flux, area, and so on. So how do I proceed from these astronomical data to find something like delta 13 value? Well, we've obtained ROIs, so all that we do is we apply these ROIs to different elements of that image to do whatever calculations that are needed. And we filter some of the data or outputs for, for particular purposes, for example, inclusions that are too close to the edges may not be suitable for shape analysis. Sorry. <laughs> and those, two, those which are too small may not be suitable for isotope analysis. Now let's look at the results. First of all, in terms of size and shape. This slide introduces a typical, typical carbon image of each, each species. And we are already seeing some distinct features. So the CH3 chondrite consists of uh, large inclusions, and they tend to be very, very round, whereas CR2 chondrites consist of small inclusions, and a large fraction of them looks uh, elongated. And the CM chondrite sits somewhere in, somewhere in the middle between CH and CRs. Now, how do we quantitatively interpret these images? Uh, in terms of area, or in terms of size, we can do a histogram by sorting by area. And as we saw in the previous slide, CL chondrites are heavily skewered towards small inclusions, whereas CH3 chondrite sees a flatter distribution over a large range of areas, and CM sits somewhere in the middle. What about in terms of shape? Um, here, I've given three labels, um, round, elliptical, and flat, depending upon the value of ellipticity. And ellipticity is defined as 1 minus uh, the ratio of two axes. Um, sorry. And CH3, nearly three quarters of the whole population consists of round objects, whereas CR chondrites are dominated by a sum of elliptical and flat inclusions. And again, CM2 chondrite sits somewhere in the middle. 
What about results in terms of isotopes? Here, it's, it's the same plot, but now sorted by carbon ratio, uh, expressed by delta notation. And just a reminder, this is how you calculate the delta value. And if you look at the media, which represents the bulk value of each given set of data, they approach uh, some of the bulk values measured by different techniques, except for the CR3, uh, which is a little off. And that's because, as you remember from the, if you remember from the pre previous, uh, pl previous plot, most of the CR3 chondrites inclusions are skewed towards very small inclusions. And I'm only including uh, inclusions which have area of over 100 pixels. So for CR, I'm actually including only this tiny fraction for statistics. And that's why it's a little off. Uh, in terms of distribution, uh, CM2 chondrite sees almost every inclusion between negative 100 and 100, whereas CH and CR sees a flatter distribution, giving anomalous carbon ratios. What about nitrogen ratio? Um, CM2 chondrite again approaches the literature value, and as we expected from uh, other measurements, CH and CRs, which are known for having inclusions which show anomalous nitrogen ratios, their median are relatively high. And CH3 chondrite especially shows inclusions that have more than beyond 1500 uh, per mil for nitrogen ratio. Uh, this is the this is sa same set of data, but in a different representation. Um, the x and y axes are just normal ratios. Uh, the major isotope over minor isotope, and it's in log scale. And we can clearly see some distinct groups um, in terms of isotope abundances. At this stage, we don't exactly know what they are. But um, they can be in, uh, organics in here, or pre-solar graphite may be there, and so on. What about in terms of um, spatial distribution? Uh, here we are looking at a total of 25 single images, um, X Im uh, five images in X and Y directions. Now, what, what, what we can see is that uh, carbon inclusions in the CM chondrite are uniformly spread, whereas those in the CR2 chondrite, for example, are cluttered in a small region. And how do we quantify that? Uh, one way may be by just counting uh, how many neighbors each inclusion sees in a given radius. And this is a plot up to 500 pixels. And as we saw from the previous slide, uh, CR2 chondrite shows the steepest gradient. And the uniformly, uniformly spread CM2 chondrite uh, sees a flatter gradient. And by the way, error bar is so small that it's not visible there. What about in terms of clustering? Um, I'm sure there are many algorithms or techniques available for clustering analysis. But one way is by calculating the segregation ratio based on the minimum spanning tree, MST. And here's a basic recipe for this analysis. First of all, we sort inclusions from the highest to the lowest in parameter of interest. And this parameter can be anything, area, ellipticity, carbon ratio, nitrogen ratio, and so forth. Now, I calculate the length of MST of any inclusions of interest and compare that with average length of MST of n randomly selected inclusions and calculate the seg seg segregation ratio denoted by lambda. And I repeat the same process for range of ends. So there were many, a lot of uh, there were a lot of words uh, confusing in the last slide. So I'm going to reword it by using this animation. So in this plot, these five red dots represent inclusions which show the highest values in some parameter. Now, for simplicity, let's say these represent five largest inclusions in this given set of data and the yellow dots represent the rest. 
Now, I first of all calculate the length of this network, denoted, uh, which is denoted as L int. And in the meantime, I calculate the length of 1,000 randomly selected sets and take the average of that. And the ratio of these two parameters uh, represents the segregation ratio. And if this segregation ratio approaches one, and that would mean the length of this, these five get, uh, length of the network formed, formed by these five big inclusions is roughly equal to the average of the random selection, uh, random inclusions, meaning there's no clustering occurring there. Um, but if that's beyond one, then the length of this network is shorter than that of this average then that, that indicates clustering may occur. And I repeat the same process for different ends. Now, if I plot the results out, uh, segregation ratio for area and ellipticity was one throughout the ends, throughout all ends, indicating no clustering. But in terms of isotope ratios, for example, delta 13, there's clearly some uh, different features there. Uh, for example, CH's MST, minimum spanning tree, was up to five times shorter than the average, whereas CR's was about two times or three times shorter than the average of randoms. In terms of nitrogen ratio, we see a similar, similar result in the CH chondrite, showing up to about four times shorter uh, network length. So, <laughs> Here's the conclusion. Uh, I present, we present the new approach to statistically investigate meteoric organics, which may add a large amount of new information on them. Uh, what sort of information? Uh, size and roundness of inclusions both follow this order, CH, CM, and CR. Clustering analysis signifies that isotope anomalies may tend to cluster in some meteorites. And Finally, a better understanding of nature of extraterrestrial organics will to lead to a better understanding of building blocks of life. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. This is a. <laughs>